these days it's easy to come by a copy of Julian's book, Revelations of Divine Love, so it seems safe to assume that people have been reading it ever since she wrote it, more than 600 years ago. But Julian's book disappeared, and it's only thanks to an unknown company of steadfast women that we have it in our hands today. But let's start right at the beginning. This is the earliest manuscript of Julian's book. It was written in 1413, and Julian was still alive and living in the little room beside St. Julian's Church in Norwich. She had been seventy then, a great age in those days when you were lucky to live to fifty. This is the scribe's introduction. There is a vision showed by the goodness of God to a devout woman, and her name is Julian, who is a recluse at Norwich and yet is in life, Anno Domine 1413. And it's only from this manuscript, or one like it, that we know her name was Julian and that she lived in Norwich. She didn't sign her book. After the scribe's introduction, Julian's book begins. I desired three graces by the gift of God. The first was to have mind of Christ's passion. The second was bodily sickness. And the third... Wait a moment. Julian's book doesn't start like that. It begins... These revelations were shown to an unlettered woman in the year of our Lord, 1373, on the 8th day of May. What's going on? This manuscript isn't the full text of Julian's book. It's a sort of Reader's Digest version. It only has 25 chapters instead of 86, and it wasn't discovered until it turned up in a book sale in 1909, by which time Julian's book was already in print. So what became of the manuscript of the complete book? It seems like this one. It must have gone underground, passed round among trusted friends. Why? Because it was dangerous to own. Just the fact that Julian quoted the Bible in English made it dangerous. Latin was the language of the church, and translating the Bible into English was strictly forbidden. The scholar Wycliffe had done just that, and handwritten copies were secretly going the rounds in Norwich. And if the authorities thought Julian had a copy, she'd have been accused of being a lollard and burnt at the stake. <laughs> no wonder her friends kept quiet. A hundred years later, having a Bible in English wasn't forbidden, it was compulsory. After the Pope refused to annul his marriage to Catherine of Aragon and set him free to marry Anne Boleyn, Henry VIII declared himself head of the English Church. Then, in defiance of the Pope's ban, he commissioned a new translation of the Bible into English and ordered every parish in the country to buy a copy. The title page shows the heavens opening and Henry receiving the word of God direct from above. He then hands it out to Thomas Cranmer, representing the clergy, on one side, and Thomas Cromwell, representing the nobility, on the other. They, in turn, pass it down the social scale until it reaches the common people, who receive it with joyful shouts of God save the king and vivat rex. Those who questioned the king's claim to be head of the church lived short lives. And even staying silent wasn't enough to save Sir Thomas More from imprisonment and execution. And Thomas More's family plays a big part in passing Julian's book on to us today. Here they are in Holbein's sketch for the More family portrait in 1527. Thomas More stands in the centre. On the left is his daughter Elizabeth Daunce, and his adopted daughter, Margaret Griggs, bending towards his father, old John Moore. Thomas's son, John, stands on his left, with his fiancée, Anne Cressica, on his right. In the front row, there's his youngest daughter, Cecily Heron, and the eldest, Margaret Roper. His wife, Alice, kneels in the background. It might seem odd to tuck her away like this, but she's his second wife, married after he was widowed, and not the mother of his children. John Moore and Anne Cressica married the following year, and it's their great-great-granddaughters who play a part in this story. 
Margaret Roper's great-great-granddaughter plays a part too. Her name was Barbara Constable. Now, during the years when the Moore family have been producing children and grandchildren and great-grandchildren, there have been huge changes in England. King Henry has died, and his son Edward, the quest for whose birth was the cause of so many deaths, has died too, aged only fifteen, after a six-year reign. His half-sister Mary reigned for only five but during those five years the Moore family could safely go to Mass once more, and Catholics were no longer hung, drawn, and quartered at Tyburn. Protestants were burnt at the stake at Smithfield instead. Then, for the whole of Elizabeth's long reign, Catholicism was once more a criminal offence. When Mary, Queen of Scots' son James succeeded Elizabeth, Catholics hoped he would repeal the anti-Catholic laws. But the discovery of the Catholic Guy Fawkes in the cellar of the Houses of Parliament with 36 barrels of gunpowder didn't do much to improve their popularity. And so, when King James' son Charles came back from a visit to Spain with the news that the plan for him to marry the Catholic princess Anna Maria had fallen through, Englishmen once more lit bonfires in the streets to celebrate the failure of what they saw as yet another popish plot. And it was in that year, 1623, that nine young English women set off to found a new convent at Cambrai in the Netherlands. Three of them were members of the Moore family. There were two sisters, Agnes and Anne, and their cousin Gertrude and there were two members of the Gascoigne family, Catherine Gascoigne and her cousin, Margaret Vavasor. The others were Mary Hoskins, Jane Martin, Anne Morgan, and Anne Timperley. The oldest of them was twenty-two. Gertrude Moore was the youngest. She was seventeen. Gertrude was an heiress, and she brought her substantial fortune with her. She must have taken it in gold and jewels. There were no bank transfers back then. The Gascoins bought treasures too. Manuscripts that had been handed down in their families for generations. Among them, it seems, was a copy of Julian's book. The English College at Douay sent the new nuns a spiritual director, Augustine Baker. He encouraged them to practice contemplative prayer by studying 14th century spiritual writings. These old books were hard to come by. But Augustine Baker knew the renowned collector Sir Robert Cotton, and he wrote to him in London, asking him to send, Such books as you please, either manuscript or printed, being in English, containing contemplation, saints' lives, or other devotions. The sisters' lives being contemplative, there is little or nothing in these days printed in English that is proper for them. Nothing, you would have thought, could have been more innocent. But falling out in religious communities is not unheard of, and in 1633 the president of the English Benedictine congregation called in all the convent's books and manuscripts for examination by the chapter. It was an anxious time, and it took weeks before the sisters finally managed to persuade their male colleagues to let them keep their books. Gertrude Moore, whose fortune had made the venture possible, died of smallpox while the lengthy examination was going on. She was twenty-seven. But at last the prioress, Catherine Gascoigne, was able to tell the sisters the president had written to her, "'Go on courageously. You have chosen the best way.' We beseech Almighty God to accomplish that union which your heart desires. Even so, the monks insisted on checking and licensing the books the nun could read. But this threat had shown the sisters how easily their books could be lost, and they began to make more and more copies of them. They needed them too, because the convent was growing fast. In one year alone, 1640, Eleven more new novices came over from England. Among them were two Gascoigne sisters, five Carey sisters, we'll hear more about them later, plus another of the Moore family, 
Margaret Roper's great-great-granddaughter, Barbara Constable. Barbara Constable had beautiful, clear handwriting, and she copied many of the manuscripts. Here's a chapter of Julian's book in an anthology she made of other writings. But these were turbulent times in England. The country was embroiled in nearly ten years of civil war. This painting shows Cromwell's roundheads questioning a young boy, When did you last see your father? The Carey sisters were well aware this sort of thing could happen. Two of their brothers had been killed fighting on the royalist side. The little boy might almost be their brother Lucius' son. He was just eleven when his father was killed. When Oliver Cromwell defeated Charles I and had him executed, life became even harder for Catholics, and it wasn't too easy for Protestants either. For ten years, even celebrating Christmas became a criminal offence. The year Cromwell came to power, the convent had a new chaplain, Serena's Cressy. By now there were fifty sisters in the convent, and they were running out of money. They turned down the official suggestion that some of them should go to other convents, and in 1651 they decided to seek help from Charles I's widow, Henrietta Maria. She had taken refuge with her re relations, the French royal family, after her husband was executed, and she knew the Carey family well. The eldest daughter, Victoria, had been one of her maids of honour. So it was two of the Carey sisters, Clementia and Mary, who set off for Paris. The hundred-mile journey would have taken them four days. They travelled in secular clothing, and they took with them their most precious possessions, copies of all their manuscripts. Henrietta Maria was delighted to see them, and though she now had little enough money herself, she had influential friends. Things looked so promising that Clementia was able to rent a house and sent word back to Cambrai. Five more nuns, together with Serena's Cressy, made the four-day journey to Paris. Justina Gascoigne, the niece of Catherine the Cambrai Prioress, was one of them. And then there was another of the Moore family, Bridget, whom they chose to be Prioress. She was Agnes and Anne's younger sister, who joined the convent as soon as she was old enough. This is a copy she made of Julian's book. Meanwhile, back in Cambrai, the precious manuscripts were once more under threat. In 1655, Dom Claude White, the new president of the English Benedictine congregation, arrived at the convent in person and summoned the abbess before him. He ordered the sisters to surrender their contemplative books. These, he said, are perceived to contain poisonous, pernicious, and diabolical doctrine. But once again, the abbess and the sisters refused to surrender their books, and after a long struggle, they were eventually allowed to keep them. Now, something we've overlooked in this gallop through history is the advance of technology. A hundred years after Julian wrote her book, something life-changing happened. Johannes Gutenberg invented movable type printing. And in 1476, William Caxton set up his first printing press at Westminster. The first book of the press was won by Julian's exact contemporary, Geoffrey Chaucer's The Canterbury Tales. It had been copied out many times since he wrote it a hundred years earlier. This is the most famous manuscript. It's one of 83. By contrast, only three complete manuscript copies of Julian's book survive. The new printing presses worked at lightning speed compared with copying by hand. So why, you may ask, are the sisters still spending their time laboriously writing out Julian's book when they could simply have sent the whole thing off to the printers? The difficulty lay in what she wrote. 
much of it did not appear to be the same as the teaching of the church in her day. Julian herself knew this, and she wrote, Now, during all this time, from beginning to end, I had two different kinds of understanding. One was the endless continuing love, with its assurance of safekeeping and salvation, for this was the message of all the showings. The other was the day-to-day -day teaching of Holy Church, in which I had been taught and grounded beforehand, and which I understood and practiced with all my heart. God himself showed me the higher judgment at that time, and therefore I must needs accept it. And the lower judgment was taught me by Holy Church, and therefore there was no way in which I could forsake the lower judgment. And I still stand in longing, and shall until I die, to understand, by grace, these two judgments as I ought to. One of the first scribes who copied out Julian's book recognized this contradiction, and he wrote this, I pray, Almighty God, that this book may not come except into the hands of those who wish to be his faithful lovers, and those who will submit themselves to the faith of Holy Church, and obey the wholesome understanding and teaching of men who are of virtuous life, settled age, and profound learning. And beware you do not accept one thing which is according to your pleasure and liking, and reject another, for that is the disposition of heretics." but accept it all together and understand it truly. It all agrees with Holy Scripture and is founded upon it. Well, that was all very well, but for casual readers, heresy would leap out from every page. And what's more, the new printing presses brought with them the alarming prospect that heretical books could now be produced quickly and in large numbers. The Church took action. In 1547 it published the Index of Forbidden Books, and after that no book might be printed without its seal of approval. And in spite of this, Serena's Cressy now decided to put Julian's book into print. The sisters owned at least seven manuscripts. They collated them and prepared a detailed fair copy for the printer to follow. The beautiful bit of penmanship would have looked like this. And here we have to take a leap back into English history once more. After the experience of Cromwell's Commonwealth, the English had decided they were better off with a king after all, and sent for Henrietta Maria's son to come back as Charles II. Now a king, as we've seen, needs an heir and so Charles II looked round to find a suitable wife. He settled on a Portuguese princess, Catherine of Braganza. She wasn't a beauty, and at twenty-three was old to be a royal bride. She was deeply religious, and had spent most of her life in a convent. The Portuguese were delighted with the marriage settlement. They got the backing of the powerful English in their war with Spain. The English were happy, too. They got Tangier, the seven islands of Bombay, and two million Portuguese crowns in gold. What Catherine got out of it was the duty to provide an heir and freedom of worship. This meant her household could include six Catholic priests. When the English college at Douay heard that a Catholic priest could be sent to England legally, they at once recalled Serena's Cressy from the Paris convent and sent him to London as one of Catherine's chaplains. It was just as well that Catherine had the consolation of religion. After three miscarriages she failed to produce an heir, but clearly it was not the fault of her husband. He fathered fifteen children by twelve different mistresses. But Catherine of Braganza achieved something else, for it was thanks to her that Serena's Cressy was able to get Julian's book printed for the first time. But how did he get the required stamp of approval? The answer is 
that he relied on family connections to slip it past the censors. In the preface to the book he writes, Whatsoever benefit thou may reap by this book, thou art obliged for it to a more venerable abbot of our nation, by whose order and liberality it is now published, and by consequence sufficiently approved. The abbot was Placid Gascoigne of Lambspring. He was the brother of Catherine Gascoigne, the first prioress of the Cambrai convent. So now you may think we've come to the end of a long journey. Julian's book is in print in England. All that remains is for it to go to the top of the bestseller list. Alas, no. The English were suspicious of this nest of Catholics at the Queen's court, and there were rave reviews, but not the complimentary kind. Edward Stillingfleet, the Bishop of Worcester, wrote the official reply. He called it, A discourse concerning the idolatry practiced in the Church of Rome and the danger of salvation in communion of it. Here's a few quotes. The blasphemous and senseless tittle-tattle of this hysterical gossip. The fanatic revelations of distempered brains. Deserves no other name at best than the efforts of religious madness. So Julian's book once more returned to obscurity. Back in the convents in Paris and Cambrai, the sisters continued to safeguard their precious manuscripts until disaster overtook them. During the French Revolution in 1793, the nuns were imprisoned and all their books and manuscripts were confiscated. The sisters were kept in prison for 18 months, during which four of them died. Sixteen French Carmelite nuns who shared their prison were taken to Paris and guillotined. It was only the guillotining of Robespierre himself a few weeks later that saved the English nuns from the same fate. All the Cambrai books were lost. The sisters returned penniless to England. They had been forbidden to wear their habits, but had nothing else. They came back wearing the discarded secular clothes the dead Carmelite nuns had left behind. By now, we've reached the 19th century, and still only a handful of people know about Julian's book. In 1842, the Serenus Cressy edition was printed once more. It doesn't seem to have very many readers, but we do know the names of two of them. One of them was Florence Nightingale, who read Julian's book amid the pain and suffering of Scutari Hospital. The other was George Tyrrell, a young Jesuit priest. Afterwards he wrote an article pointing out that the Church's teaching on hell and eternal punishment for sin was at odds with the idea of a loving God who took the suffering and sins of humanity on himself in order to save us. His superiors reacted quickly. He was excommunicated. So how is it we come to have Julian's book in our hands today? It's thanks to this woman, Grace Warwick, and her story is as obscure as the story of the manuscripts. When we meet her, she's 46 years old, unmarried, third daughter of John Warwick of Edinburgh, and she'd never published a book before. All we know is that she must have made the journey to London and managed to get a reader's ticket to the British Library. And there she had put into her hands what is now called Sloane 2499, the copy of Julian's book written out by Clementia Carey 250 years before. She would have had to copy it out word for word, using pencil, you're not allowed ink in the British Library, before taking it back to Edinburgh where she modernised the spelling and wrote an introduction and critical notes. And in 1901, the first year of the 20th century, Methuen published 
Revelations of Divine Love, recorded by Julian and Ancris in Norwich, Anno Domini 1373. The title page was illustrated by Phoebe Anna Traquair, one of the leading women artists in the arts and crafts movement in Edinburgh. The rest, as they say, is history. Evelyn Underhill quoted Julian in her 1911 book Mysticism. The influential writer Charles Williams was Underhill's friend, and he knew C.S. Lewis and T.S. Eliot. T.S. Eliot quoted Julian's in The Four Quartets, published in 1944, and all shall be well, and all manner of things shall be well, joined by this joining, made holy by this holiness. Since then, Julian's book has never been out of print. That may sound like the end of the story, but it's not quite. When Henry VIII shut down the centuries-old Zion Abbey in 1539, its treasures were looted and the books in its famous library were taken away. The sisters of Zion Abbey managed to save a few of their books and took them with them into exile. They settled first in Amsterdam, and later they moved to Portugal. But Zion's reputation was tarnished when Thomas Robinson, a seaman who had been given shelter in the monastery after he jumped ship, published a vicious attack on them once he got back to England. He mixed just enough fact with tales of scandalous goings-on to make some English Catholics think it might be wiser to start a new convent, and so Cambrai was founded. Today, just three complete manuscript copies of Julian's book survive. Two of them, in the British Library, were written by the sisters whose history we've been tracing. The third found its way into the Bibliothèque Nationale in Paris. It's the most beautiful, and many modern editions are based on it. The paper on which it is written has an Amsterdam watermark of around 1580, 50 years before the Cambrai convent was founded. Scholars believe it's the work of the steadfast sisters of Zion. We shall never know the full story. So for now, let's just rejoice in all the people who have treasured Julian's book down the centuries, those we know and those whose names are unknown, and say with them and for them, Thanks be to God. <laughs>